Jim, while I'm on stories on TMZ Sports, is another wrestling-related story, it turns out, here. <laughs> Man, me, wait a minute. This is not the one you're thinking of. No? No, I think, uh, All right. I think we'll wait a little bit for that one. Okay. The headline, Hacksaw Jim Duggan detains home intruder at gunpoint <laughs> using 44 caliber pistol. <laughs> Hacksaw Jim Duggan has had his fair shares of battles inside and outside the ring but perhaps none scarier than when the WWE legend recently had to ward off an intruder in his South Carolina home. 68-year-old Duggan told the story in an interview with Wrestling Inc., saying someone broke into his South Carolina home around 6.45 p.m. on Thursday, December 8th. Jim says he took the man, who was in his mid-20s, down to the ground <laughs> and then held the guy at gunpoint using a 44 caliber pistol Jim's wife, Deborah, was also home at the time of the horrifying incident. As if the guy breaking in wasn't scary enough, Jim and Deborah heard other people in the neighborhood yelling, which made them fear more danger was on the way. The intruder reportedly knocked on multiple doors, seeking refuge from a separate legal matter, <laughs> before ultimately entering Duggan's home through an unlocked front door as a last resort. Thank God we didn't shoot him, the Hall of Famer said. Well, go ahead. Well, I'm just going to so basically this guy's already running from somebody else and trying to get away by getting in somebody else's house and people are in the neighborhood are yelling, hey, what's this fucking guy doing? So that he had apparently caused a big stir before he got there. Go ahead. Thank God we didn't shoot him, the WWE Hall of Famer said, who declined to press charges on the intruder. On Saturday, Jim, who previously battled prostate cancer, commended the Kershaw County Sheriff's Department in South Carolina for responding and apprehending the intruder. Quote, We would like to thank the, Ker <laughs> the Kershaw County Sheriff's Department for their prompt and professional response last week. Thanks to everyone for the concern and well wishes. Hey, it, it, they better be glad either... Either Jimbo was in a good mood or just, you know, he's aged more gracefully than he used to be or whatever, or they would have been thanking the Kershaw Police Department for rescuing this fucking guy from Hacksaw. I'm surprised. He better be thankful he used the gun. If he hadn't held the gun on him and, and just used some of those big fucking feet. Everyone always talks about how great Jim Duggan was in Mid-South Wrestling, that if you only saw him in WWE, you have to see him in Mid-South. Well, yeah, it's not even... Same thing. But how bad was he in Mid-South Wrestling? <laughs> I guarantee you he's had, they said it must have been one of the scariest times. Duggan was a heel in Mid-South before they switched him babyface. So, and he was in Homa and Laranja and fucking Tulsa and part of the Rat Pack and the whole nine yards and blah, blah, blah. So he had some scarier times in the buildings, and I guarantee you, because I was there, he had a few more major skirmishes outside the ring while he was a babyface than this probably was. This guy, like I said, was lucky. As a matter of fact, he, the guy's lucky. Deborah wasn't fucking cranky. Do you remember one of the TVs they did? Oh, God, when... Duggan was working the deal with DiBiase, and then they, they kept having the tuxedo matches and the sharp-dressed man matches. And I think it was that because Duggan had his girlfriend with him. He's in the white tux, and she's dressed up. And he said, and my girl Punchy here, that's Deborah. They're still married. She would have killed this fucking guy. But he had bigger fucking skirmishes at the lighthouse in, or the fight house in Alexandria than this but um and that's again people don't understand the difference in presentation with some guys and i know hacksaw made more money as yo in the you know wwf working for vince it was but, ho not yo yo ho what i'm <laughs> yo right. yo well caster's got me now caster's <laughs> got me goddamn brainwashed ho and the tube and i was i was with jim uh, a few years ago at a fan fest and he <laughs> had his guy go out and get to Home Depot and get these just tuba, not even tuba fours because that would be too heavy, but these pieces of wood and just cut them down into two foot sections and autographed them and sold them for 40 bucks. Oh, you know, the hacksaw dug in tuba four. He's fucking great. And he made a ton of money with that gimmick. 
But in Mid-South Wrestling, the babyface Hacksaw Jim Duggan was the perfect babyface for that territory. Top guy. And he, he maybe not always the top guy because you needed you needed either the champion like Magnum TA, the good looking kid, the white meat baby face. We used to call Duggan the kick ass baby face type. And he was perfect when JYD was the top baby face because they were completely different people. And they obviously had completely different gimmicks, completely different styles. And they could coexist. And still, you know, and when they were a team, it was incredible. Not so much for their opponents, but it was incredible at the box office every once in a while. And, but just it, not only his work and it, but his promos and his demeanor, as Finkel would say, and his attitude and the way that he could talk to people and come off so real because he was just being himself. He was just being himself and it was just completely fucking turned up. And God, those people fucking loved him. But but yes, he was known for, you know, if anybody got out of line either in the ring or out of the ring, he was known for beeling people for fucking distance and accuracy across crowded rooms. With all the attempts at replacing the junkyard dog with various African-American wrestlers, do you think Watts should have just focused on Duggan? In hindsight, yes, because I see why he was doing it because he didn't want Duggan was already over and Duggan was already involved in main events. He didn't want to have the same guy just maybe, you know, do a little something different with him or put the belt on him or whatever. He wanted to try to fill a hole that he perceived that he had, that he suddenly had and that he did have without really monkeying with a guy that was already successful over on the other side and and involved in different things. And because remember at the time, he really had three top baby faces because you had JYD who was established. You had Duggan who had switched baby face. Uh, what in 83 was it? It was 83. 80, and, and he had gotten established by 84 when, when dog left. And then you also had actually four, because Magnum T.A. and Terry Taylor were both at various points filling the good-looking, traditional babyface North American champion role through 84 and 85. So he had that. He was just trying to fill a hole rather than, but it ended up in the you know latter stages of the company, he went with Duggan anyway because Duggan was the most popular guy. Do you think... Looking in hindsight now, should they have kept Butch Reed and Buddy together, or was it the right move to turn Butch Reed babyface right there? Um, because you were still there when that happened. Yeah, well, because the boy, you forget how many uh, it was. Master G, and they tried. They didn't try Snowman till the year after. Yeah, Master G was first, and um, Sonny King was already there Sonny when that King happened. Sonny King was there, and they tried, and and they even tried a little bit with Brickhouse. Brickhouse Brown, they tried too. But um, I, yeah, I think that was probably maybe the worst part because those guys came in, didn't get over, but it didn't matter because they it they hadn't been over to begin with, so we lost nothing. But with Butch. I think he and Buddy especially were so good, and Butch was such a good heel. Maybe again, if if Watts had just not been fixated on we've got to have a black baby face, you know, we're going to lose that segment of the audience. Butch, it, it wasn't like Butch was old as a heel at that point. It had been fucking, he was still doing great. You know, the interesting thing to think about, the what if, is what happens to the crowds in New Orleans if JYD stays, because there's no guarantee they ever return to where they were. There's no guarantee they stay where they are. So what do you think happens if JYD stays and, you know, that event doesn't rattle Mid-South Wrestling for the remainder, of, you know, for the remainder of its existence, but at least through the remainder of right. four? Do you think it made a giant difference in New Orleans or had the damage already been done in a few different ways with JYD in New Orleans? Um, well, in a few different ways, uh, you talked about that, uh, who was it? Mike Mills 
and uh, and some other people from that area have done interviews talking about that it was starting to be known that dog had a problem he was in the bad neighborhood in new orleans on a regular basis and and he couldn't hide yeah professor ricardo coleman was on 605 super podcast and he That's grew up right. he grew up in the projects so he remembers you know when dog would be there the buzz was all around and that was a lot of the people that were going to one of the arenas in New Orleans because there were various different places with various different crowds. Yeah. And the downtown auditorium was the the big one for Dog. And that's where they'd had the tremendous business when he first got hot and got in the, the birds and uh, DiBiase turning heel and the whole nine yards. By the time we got there in 84, that's the one town. I mean, everything was down at that point. But that's the one town that it seemed because they were still running it weekly on Monday nights at the downtown building. They hadn't gone to the UNO Lakefront Arena yet, and they weren't going to St. Bernard anymore. So it was really downtown in the Dome for the first bit there. And the downtown building, I was kind of disappointed in because I wasn't seeing, you know, that it was dangerous, but I wasn't seeing the fucking big houses. It wasn't a big payoff in the territory anymore because Dog had cooled off. So. You know, and then also you saw by the Superdome match, Dog just wasn't in, he he didn't have it in the ring anymore because of his conditioning and however long he'd been staying up and whatever the fuck. So it may have been that New Orleans wasn't going to end up doing well for the rest of the year either just because... And and then the, the knee lift from wrestling too when they turned him heel. And I was going to ask you about that, yeah. <laughs> and Doc just kind of fucking shivered and 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 the it looked it was the only shitty knee lift Mr. Wrestling Two ever gave, and it was pretty much a lot of it was Dog, and the way he took it. And that's not the only time he did that kind of bump. It's one of the weird things in yeah. his run where he would just do like a a tree falling. You know that was his bump. yeah, and and so nobody bought that. So and that's the thing is later on that year. The dome, we we peaked with the, the first dome in 84. That was 23-something thousand people. That was a $166,000 house. Or 107, I'm sorry, it was 100 and, uh, 167. But anyway, that was the big one. The next one was about the same thing or close, and then it started dropping because that's when Dog left. And at the same time, the downtown auditorium houses, as I recall, started pretty much going down to the point where they started going more to the UNO Lakefront Arena, which that started doing better than, I remember one specifically, a $47,000 house there, uh, that was better than anything we had done at the downtown auditorium financially, and it was a whole different crowd. It was people that didn't want to go downtown anymore, but now they would come out there. So the the New Orleans changed and the bigger houses were at the lakefront arena and then the dome, you know, kind of petered on out by the end of the year to where it just did a hundred thousand dollars on Thanksgiving. And that was the scaffold match. We did like $5,000 difference in Houston at Sam Houston Coliseum where we were at every two weeks and the dome, which was the fourth dome that year, $5,000 $5,000 difference in the house for the same main event. So New Orleans really, you know, and it never, it never picked back up. And that was the first place that Scott Muntz noticed about the problem when he called Watts, what, a year and a half later and said, well, I think we're, we're fixing to be fucked. The, all the escort services in New Orleans have closed down. And Watts is like, what the fuck? Get your own pussy. And he said, no, you don't understand. If you can't get a hooker in New Orleans, there's no money here. And he was right. Well, I guess we'll transition to the next scandalous story from TMZ Sports. I was about to say, you can't really do a sponsor transition off out-of-business hookers, can you? No, you can't. (laughs) 